a simple remedy. If everything goes that easily, yeah, we'll be in good shape. Welcome. Welcome to the Governance Forum. I'm Ned Lang. I've been a resident since 2007 and was a member of the Board of Trustees and chair of the Governance Committee for a bit. Our co-presenter is Bill Anderson, a resident since 2012 and past president of the Residence Council and currently a member of the Board of Trustees Finance Committee. At the uh, request of the, the Board's Governance Committee, Bill and I have put on this forum now four times. This is our fourth time. We started in 2014 and repeated it in 17 and 19. And here we are again to refresh our recollections and to uh, educate new residents as well and any changes uh, in up to date, and which at this time there aren't many other than in personnel. The uh, slides will try to be changed if I can keep the numbers straight. Uh, oops. Here we are. This is going to be an overview of governance. And well, what are we talking about? What is governance? This slide, I think, has a good definition. Uh, the only expansion I would make is it's, we're talking at Horizon House. We have two governing boards because we have two governing bodies. And that is a, a very significant difference uh, from a lot of a lot of CCRCs. We have the Residence Council and the Board of Trustees Horizon House. I'm going to be addressing primarily the governance of Horizon House and Bill's going to do the Resident Council. But both are independent corporations, non-profit, and both are 501c3 corporations. 501c3 being a shortcut to uh, say that they are, un it's the citation in the Internal Revenue Code which defines charitable uh, corporations which are entitled to uh, exemption from taxes as well as eligible to uh, have their donations made to them be tax deductible. The Okay, this is it outlines the first what the uh, Horizon House dealing with providing the facility for. Oh my God! <laughs> okay, providing us with with housing and services and the residence council, the separate one which is deals with the residence life through its activities of education and so forth. Now, the articles, the Board of Trustees for Horizon House. Let's see if I missed one here. Nope. Good. The size of the Board of Trustees, 10 to 15, it's up to the Board to set the size. The articles provide that the board can establish the size. Currently, there are 13 trustees insofar as how they are selected. One is the president of the Residence Council, the Horizon House Residence Council, by virtue of being president, is a member of the Board of Trustees. Another member is a designee of the Conference of the United Church of Christ. A little bit of history here. The United Church of Christ, the UCC, established Horizon House approximately 60 years ago now. Up until 1918, the Board of Directors of Horizon House was elected by the Pacific Northwest Conference of the UCC. They were nominated by the Board of Trustees, sent to the conference, and they elected them. In 19, or 2018, 
uh, we changed that at the request of the conference minister. We, it was, had become a mere formality to the conference to uh, approve the election. And the conference said, hey, let's, let's uh, be realistic and uh, you select them and you elect them. And we also, at the same time, uh, they asked that the chair or the conference minister of the UCC no longer be a member of the board of trustees and he sat without a vote but the UCC had a designee and continues to have a designee on the board of trustees so of the board two members are by virtue of the UCC and one the resident council the, uh, interestingly enough, the, uh, the, UCC, the UCC would also be the recipient of any assets which would remain after a liquidation of Horizon House. This is not a fact or a, an event we contemplate at all happening, but <laughs> should, should it happen, they are uh, the recipient of the, uh, by, uh, by law, of the, uh, the assets uh, of it. And to, we continue to have the one designee of the board. Although you, Horizon House was established by the UC, it, uh, it has always been open and welcoming to all faiths and all persons. And it has never uh, controlled the membership or, or the residents from the, any other standpoint. That has been unlimited. Turning to the members of the board other than the council president and the UCC designate, these are elected by the board of trustees. The process of selection, it's managed by the governance committee. It has to identify and uh, cultivate and educate and evaluate potential members. They're always seeking uh, qualified people uh, and they start by identifying what skills are necessary. Are there some particular areas of uh, personnel on the board, areas of activity or uh, skill that is absent from the current board? Uh, let's go out and see if we can fill those. What type of uh, skills are they going to need in the next few years? Uh, try to find people who uh, would do that. The, uh, basically, you want ex hopefully get experienced people, possibly some non-profit experience, knowledgeable and dedicated to the mission of Horizon House and, and willing to, to work work on that and it's you're talking 15 at least meetings a year between the committees and the and the board that a member commits to and our board members are all volunteers none of them are paid or anything like that the governance committee is always welcome to uh, suggestions and uh, maintains a potential list of uh, uh, members basically leadership, commitment, and uh, they nominate, the committee, governance committee nominates and then the board elects the uh, members. They can serve for a three year, they serve for a three year term, a maximum of three terms. If a person is elected to fill an unexpired term of someone else, they are still eligible for uh, three full terms following that. Let me show you just a, a little bit of an organizational chart. Uh, and we, this, you'll notice the conference is off to the side now. It used to be at the very top of the organizational chart. And uh, we have the six standing committees and a seventh committee now dedicated to a search for a new CC CEO. Let's take a, Here are the names of the 
current trustees. Uh, and the membership at the at-large um, members, besides the resident trustee, up to one-third of the members of the Board of Trustees of Horizon House may be residents. This is a very, very unusual provision among UCCs. I think a number of us in this room have been to national meetings of UCC organizations and when we say we have residents on our Board of Trustees, the others say, what? It's, it's, it's very unusual uh, and the fact that we can have up to a third is, uh, is amazing to many and the fact that we have required at least one that has a full vote, many of them do have a token uh, resident that often it sits without a vote. Ted, could I interrupt you yes. for a second? If you're interested in the bi biographical details about any of these individuals, they're on HH We can't hear you, Bill. Turn your mic on. The, the biographical details of all these people are on HH Connect, so if you want to look to see where they came from, what their specialties are, they're all available to you. Yeah. Uh, the board, board's job, of course, is to establish the policy, make long-range plans, adopt uh, an annual budget, establish strategy for the future, hire and fire, if necessary, the CEO. They do not get involved in the day-to-day -day administration. The board um, works through committees. And here, I'm sorting of the current membership of the board, and one additional I forgot to mention You'll notice that in addition to the resident members who are residents on the board, the parents of one of the board members, Harold Zeitz's parents, are members, are residents of Horizon House. So that gives you a few voices or opportunities to lend your voice to, if, if you wish. The board works through its committees, and these committees do have non-board members on them. And among those non-board members, oops, is that right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Resident members. The resident member here are members of these committees who are residents. Some of them are board members, but most all of those are not current board members members. And you can use these committee assignments as a probation period or a testing ground and an, and an education ground for potential board members for the future. They can, are a source of good talent and of course the residents provide a uh, uh, good grounds for uh, identifying uh, potential board members. Um, I think that is about as much as I want to say, and I want to turn it over to Bill to talk about the resident council. Bill? All right. Is this on now? I have to watch my language. Thank you, Dad. Now let's see how to get this thing to move to the next slide. There. Okay, here's the equivalent of the, uh, the screen that Ned just showed us with respect to the board. This, the size of the council, it's 15 members. Um, and that's been increased when, I guess seven or eight years ago, it was 12. And we thought that it might be better to make it a little larger. There was a lot of work to do, a lot of jobs to assign. And also, the larger the, the council was, the more representative it could be. So we enlarged it to 15. The members are selected or elected 
by the residents. And we just went through an election, and you've seen the new people that were uh, were elected. And since every board member, every council member, uh, serves for three years, that means every year, the way they're staggered, every year we need five new members to cover the people whose terms are expiring. And so that means we have a, a turnover, a regular turnover, and we just elected five new members. And if, if for some reason a, a council member can't complete a term for whatever reason, then the nominating committee will uh, suggest somebody else and they'll be, they'll be picked. So we'll always have 15, 15 members and they're serving three-year terms and I think they're non-renewable terms. So there's a fair turnover in this thing. A lot of residents get involved in council work and that is really essential to the spirit of this enterprise. It can't be just a group of insiders, everybody, the same people always do the same things. It has to be a, a rapid turnover and a broad, a broad representation. The functions of the council, there are hundreds of them, but the two basic ones that really matter, the two umbrellas that cover all the things that the council does, are first of all to operate and fund and initiate and manage all the activities you see. Um, Ned said if you go to a national meeting, and I went to one a few years ago, uh, other CCRCs, which is the category we're in, um, it's a big business. There were 10,000 people at this convention. It was in Nashville at the convention center there. And you learn a lot of stuff in the speeches and all that stuff. But you learn a lot in the elevators and the hallways and over the dinner table. And it, I had the same experience that, that Ned um, talked about when people say, well, we think the residents ought to have an important role in policy making. And we do that by letting one resident observe board meetings. <laughs> they go around the table, when they get to me, I say, well, we have three members of the board who are residents, full voting members, and, and they're shocked. It's a very rare thing around the country to have this kind of, this kind of structure. But the, one of the things that's involved in that is that the residents can function this on the second function, which is to be a conduit for resident views to the board. The board has to always make decisions and, and making decisions involves thinking about what the residents prefer, what the residents want, what the residents need, and you've got a much better picture of that if you've got some residents on the board rather than just having observers or people who send, send emails. Um, now let's see if I can figure out what the next one is. This is the structure that we now have, and it's, it's, it's been fairly stable for the last few years, but it's always subject to change, and any council can go ahead and change the arrangement of this stuff, but you'll see what you have here is basically five officers, a president, uh, a treasurer, and a, a, a secretary, and then two vice presidents, one in charge of programs and one in charge of a couple of other administrative things, and these little gray boxes across near the bottom are all the, the other council members serve as coordinators is the word, a very critical word, a very critical function too. And each of those coordinators has a cluster of committees assigned to it. And the coordinator's job is to facilitate the work of the committee, to, take, to try and remove obstacles to the committee's uh, objectives that they're trying to reach and can't get to for some reason. It is the coordinators are not running the committees, the coordinators are helping and supporting the committees. And that's a, another essential part of this uh, understanding here. We don't have a council that tells the committees what to do. We have a council that sets some rules and some policies, and the committees within that, those rules and policies can do what they want to do, and the coordinators are there to help them, make sure they get the resources and the organizational systems that they can do. And so each of the coordinators in, as they say, we'll have a group of committees that the abbreviations in these little gray boxes give you a clue as to what the groupings are like. So the actual work then of actually designing and operating the activities that we see, the lectures and the concerts and whatever, uh, it's all done by residents through the committee structure. And let's see if we can get the next, the committees, 
when I'm when I say it in Nashville uh, over a dinner table, they say, "Well, what kind of an activities director do you have?" And so on. And I say, "We don't have an activities director." And they say, "Well, how do you manage it?" Well, it's all done by committee. Oh, they say that'll never work. Well, let me tell you, it does, and it works very well. It's hard work, and the committees are hard at work. But and you can see from this list that there's a wide range of things from all the different categories you can name including assisted living. We have several committees that work with assisted living people to help in various ways. So that's, that's uh, basically the, the way this, this system runs. Uh, we elect, we residents elect the council. The council then identifies these coordinators and the coordinators coordinate these committees. And the committees can be, anybody can start a committee. Uh, anybody can sort of say, well, we need a committee on X. And so I'll, I'll propose that, and if the council says that's a good idea, if, you, if there's a demand for that activity or that service, then we'll permit the committee to exist, and then committee members will sign up. So residents get a chance to sign up for committees in an annual event, but they can really join a committee basically any time they want. But it's, uh, there is an annual time where the, all the committee descriptions are laid out for them, and they can then join. So um, that's, that's where all the work gets done. Now, let's take a look at the question, how these various parts work together. Because it's a complicated structure, and I think it's important to see uh, how the parts fit. Uh, if you think about policies, which is the basic thing that people have to do in this business, decide on policies. What are we going to do next? How much are we going to charge for this? What service are we going to afford? Uh, uh, um, what service are we going to make available to our residents and so on. Um, and these days, are we going to build a West Tower or not? Are we going to do this or that? Those are all policies that have to be made. And those are made in a, a lot of different categories. And you see some of the factors that would be taken into account in a policy decision. First of all, of course, what do the current residents need? What do the current residents want? What were the current residents promised? And so on. And that's a basic policy question. Then there's a question about future residents. Policies have to remember that this is an ongoing enterprise, and if we don't think about what future residents need or want, we're going to be in big trouble, because if we don't have the kind of facilities those folks want, then they're not going to come here, and then we have really serious financial problems. And it turns out, I didn't know this, but it turns out that styles change. And I thought, well, okay, so one day we had avocado covered refrigerators, and then five years later, people didn't want those anymore. Well, that's not a big problem. You can change the refrigerator. But suppose you get somebody, somebody told me that um, people who were uh, of a certain, in one of the generations, the baby boomers, for example, um, would not go to a place that didn't have king sized beds. Well, <laughs> Suppose you have a building built with smaller bedrooms that don't really want to hold a king size bed, and then you won't get any baby boomers. So you got, somebody has to decide about future residents, who they're going to be, what they want in the way of facilities. And to the extent changes in those styles and tastes can be easily done when you refurbish an apartment, like changing the color of a refrigerator, if the style happens to affect structural things, how large are the rooms, how high are the ceilings, and so on. Then you get into situations where if you don't uh, anticipate properly when you're building, you're going to have trouble with the future. So future residents are an important category of policies that have to be worked at, and that's a tough one. Then there's staff. Uh, policies also have to be uh, consistent with the needs of staff and the need for staff. And we're having problems right now with not getting enough staff. Uh, because we have lots of openings, but we can't find people to do them. And that's a function of all kinds of things. COVID has done a terrible job for us on that. And, and the economy is not, not helping us out very much either. But consideration of what the staff needs and wants in terms of wages and benefits and working conditions are a really important part of policies, along with the other things. Then there are things like goals, values, and ideals. And in the various... Yes? I'm a little confused. You're dealing with the resident council, but this sounds like you're defining the governance committee. At the I'm, just hang on to that. Good question. Good question. 
I'm talking about policies and the kind of things that go into making up policies. So, uh, values are very important and goals are very important. And if you look to the charters of the council and the board and the whole enterprise, you'll see lots of values stated, things about caring and things about uh, treating the environment properly and, and so on. All those things are important about, and those have to be taken into account in setting policies. And then just finally in the list here, but one of the most fundamental ones has to do with the fiscal soundness. One of the things that the policymakers have to decide is how to keep this place afloat financially. And that turns out to be a very complicated and difficult uh, proposition. Well, let's see who does what here. Um, most of these policy questions at the policy level are decided according to the charters and the contracts and all the rest of it, decided by the board. And the board takes into account factors like we've just listed to see what has to be done in terms of shall we build a west tower, shall we do this, shall we have a clinic or close the clinic, shall we have this or that around here. Those are policies that are decided basically by the board. One of the things that the board does is to hire an executive, the CEO. The CEO then hires staff, and the CEO and the staff basically, um, let's hold that, whoops, there we go. Oh boy, now where are we? Uh, well, this one. Yeah, just too many buttons here to push. Um, can you get that back to the, the, the slideshow? Sorry. <laughs> 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 Yeah, that's good. That's good. Good. Hit the air over there, yeah. <laughs> we talk about staff around here. We've got some really wonderful ones, and that you just saw one. And she saves us a lot of stuff. So here you have then an idea of, of what happens with respect to policy making done by the board and operations in terms of facilities done by the executive and the staff. And that's, that's their job. And so that's the, the carpets you see, the microphones you hear when they work, <laughs> uh, and all the rest of the stuff. Those are staff responsibilities. Now, then you have the residence council. And the residence council is in the business of dealing with activities. And if you look at this chart for a minute, you get a sense of what how these parts fit together. Policies made by the board, operations with respect to facilities done by management, operations with respect to activities done by the residence council. And the residence council, as you know, has its own source of funding. The Monday market raises thousands and thousands of dollars every year that is used to fund all the activities that these 60 or 70 committees want to do. This, I think, is a fairly typical chart for most CCRCs around the country, at least those that have residents involved in activity generation like ours. In others, there will be a line from the executive and staff marked activities, uh, but we have activities managed, funded, and run by, by residents. So this is a fairly typical arrangement. Now, what, there, there are a couple of things about this that you need to know. Two things, I think, important that have to do with how the system really works in, in the real world. The charts are always misleading in some way or other. But in the real world, there are two factors that make this different here from what it is in most other places. And one of them is that we're small. We're a small, single-campus CCRC. Most of our competitors in this business, and there are competitors, it's a very highly competitive business. Locally, Mirabella, Skyline, and those are parts of large organizations. Some of them have 50, 60, more than that, uh, campuses around the country in various places. And if you think for a minute about the relationship between the residents and the board, 
if you were part of a CCRC that was part of a national organization and the board lived in Chicago or New York, you've got one kind of opportunity to participate in policy making, not a very effective one. But here we have a board which is, they all live here in the city. They're all locals and they all know us. In fact, some of the board members wind up when they get off the board becoming residents here. We've got a couple of those. And I think it's important to get a sense of what, how, how close the connection is between the residents and policy making when you've got a small organization like this with, um, with a, a single campus. Um, now our prior, uh, Mike Ostrom's predecessor, she went on to a much larger organization in San Francisco, and it's a much different enterprise from this. And people who live in CCRCs managed by that organization may be in Nevada or Arizona or someplace. Um, and the, but the board's in San Francisco, and so it's just a different kind of an enterprise. So that's one quality that you need to think about that bears, I think, importantly on the quality of relationship between residents and policy making here. The second is that our aspirations for resident involvement in policy making are guaranteed to some degree by structure. As Ned has said, there are three members of the, of the board who are residents and they're full voting members. And it is also the case that probably a dozen residents are voting members of board committees. So we've set structural things in place that, that sort of make concrete and real the aspirations we have to have residents playing an important role in policy making. And I think that's very important. Now, again, charts are charts and words are words, but it is the case here, I think, that under the contracts and charters and stuff that we are governed by, the board has complete legal authority to do whatever they want to do. And residents have very little legal authority to do that. Those are the words. But the music behind those words, shown by these structural things we have and shown by the long traditions we have, give the residents a much deeper and more important role in policy making than the words themselves would suggest. And that, I think, is what is, is good about, one of the things that's really good about this place. It does mean, however, of course, that the board, that, that the residents have to be active and concerned and work toward that. But the avenues are there mostly. And so I think that's a, a part of this process that is um, really important. So if you look at that arrow showing you that the residents have an important role structurally in board policy making, and also, you have to add that management here, by tradition, has had an open door. And I don't know if you've written to, to Sarah McVeigh when she was here, or Mike Ostrom since he's been here, but I have. And you, you can just write him an email, and he'll answer. You can walk into his office, you can make an appointment to see him, talk to him. And that's something that I think is really a, an important tradition. So those two uh, arrows on this chart that show further resident effect on what happens, what goes on around here, it seems to me is important, and it's an important opportunity for all of us to be engaged in, in how this place is run. Now, that is, some, somebody said the other day, well, I didn't hear much music playing when they decided to build the West Tower. I saw the words, the board has authority to do that, but I don't seem to think I heard much music. And um, there's a, this great old standard in the American songbook, How High the Moon, and there's a line, somewhere there's music, how faint the tune. And a lot of people say, I can almost not hear the music in that. And I think that's an important thing. That, that's gonna happen now and then. And um, I don't know why the, the, the board didn't tell us sooner what, who, where it was going. I can anticipate, and if you ask them, they'll tell you. I've asked them, and they've told me. Uh, that they had concerns about making too early a statement about the plan for reasons having to do with competitive reaction, financial implications, public relations problems. They thought it might be better to wait until we got a little further along before we sort of identified what the plan was gonna be. And that left us out. 
which I think is probably too bad. I think they wouldn't do that the same way next time. But since it's been released, I think you can agree that everything that's been done by management here to, to deal with the concerns we had and the concerns of the people most especially affected by this, this plan, people whose views were gone or whose homes were gone, uh, I think the management has made a heroic effort to try and deal with those. So yes, in my view anyway, they, they should have let us know a little sooner that they were talking about a major expansion, um, and they didn't. Uh, they thought they had a good reason at the time, and I think that's um, they should have done it otherwise, and I have the usual 2020 hindsight. But I think since it's come out, I think they've done everything they can do to sort of make it right. And as you know, the whole project now is being reviewed because COVID and inflation and a lot of other things have made it much more expensive than they thought. And so they're having some reviews of those numbers. And if they get to a place where they think they can afford a number and the architects can design us a building for that amount, it might go ahead, it might not. They just haven't made a decision about it yet. But I think they've heard from all of us about our thoughts about it. And uh, I think that's, that's a good sign. Okay, and that's all I want to say. Um, so now it's time for questions. And uh, we've got some mics here we can pass around. And I'm going to hope that uh, you ask Ned all the questions so I don't have to worry about it. <laughs> Hi, I'd like to I'd like to know some of the reasoning behind uh, the closing down of the clinic. Uh, I know you said earlier on that people came with certain expectations and uh, I certainly came here with the expectation that there was going to be a clinic when I needed it and I just would like to know what what went into that decision I have no idea I suspect and from what I've heard and explanations that the major reason was lack of usage. Now, if any current board member or past board member were involved uh, during that decision time, want to add or anything? Mike, so Mike's don't ever work in this place. That's one of the major problems I have. Uh, the clinic is a more important issue. I, I did participate in the finance committee on the discussion of that, and I had some concern about it when I first heard it. I still have concern about it, but the reasons given, as the suggested, was that the usage of the clinic went down, and that was a function of a lot of different kind of things. Uh, and as you know, medical science changes and remedies that you can use at home and stuff that you can get on television and other sorts of things that happened in the delivery of medical service, and for that reason or some others, the, uh, the usage went down, and it seemed expensive to the board to have that cost when not many people were using it. And I made the brave argument, I thought, uh, that having a nurse available was a psychological advantage to me. I may never go see the nurse, but it's nice to know that if I've got a rash or a pain or something that's not worth a, a 911 call, uh, that I could find somebody who I could talk to. <laughs> and they said, yes, that's true, we understand that, but this is a hard world and Dollars are important, and we need that money for something else. And since people are not using that, that's all right. Now, we then we're told if we need a nurse, we get one 24-7 from nurses assigned to the assisted living business. And while we're told not to overuse those because they're busy, uh, nevertheless, it seems to me they're there. And I've heard of an example in the last two or three days of someone who had a serious problem who then they called the nurse and they got first class nurse service, they said. And the nurse got them to the emergency room and so on at, at Virginia Mason. So that system does work, but it doesn't give me the kind of psychological value that I find in having a nurse. But I guess I got to live with that. That's the best answer I can give you.
The system works. I pressed my button one morning and the nurse was there within three minutes. <laughs> this is just an aside. Is it working? Hold yes, it yes, hold it right up to your mouth. That the personality of the nurse that we had here had a lot to do yes. with the yes. usage going down. Yes, yes. 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 Uh, there's one part of your anatomy you can't reach, and that is the middle of your back. And I've had from some skin cancer, and I had to have the bandage changed every day. And I've gone there uh, to, to the second floor, and there's been there've been two nurses who've done it very agreeably. You don't have much privacy, kind of do it in the middle of the hall, <laughs> but, but they do do it, and so I've been satisfied with that. My question is, here, I'm over here. I'm curious as to why the chapel committee, the chapel choir, and the, um, uh, well, I guess I know why Sunday mornings you don't list the three worshiping communities of faith here. But I am curious why the chapel committee and the chapel choir are not listed on your very important activities. I haven't the slightest idea. <laughs> are we talking about the what's in the alert or what's in the elevator signs or? On your diagram. Oh, here. Well, there's a there's a chapel committee listed on the list of committees. Yeah, yeah. liaison, yeah. liaison committees. It's an under liaison, liaison, or liaison. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I missed it. Yeah, it, it's. Let me go back. I thought it was in there, but I. Yeah, first one is. Yep. Now come down some. One more. There it is. Chapel. Chapel. Yeah. The first line. <laughs> well, I got this list from, from Elizabeth. And of course, you know, she's never very careful about this stuff. <laughs> Now, these change. They can change. It's... <laughs> uh, residents who want to do something can do it. And if nobody wants to do it, we drop it. Uh, it's, it's very, very flexible and it's it's up to the residents as to what goes on around here as far as activities. There's just no, no one's telling you what to do on those. Any? I'd like to go back to the slide where you uh, talk about the functions of the, of the resident council. Uh, this one? No, was, I think it must be a one before. It, it lists yeah. their yeah. functions. Yeah. So you see, so it's it's, fine. It's fine. Fine. <clears throat> this raises this whole issue about resident driven, and there's been a lot of discussion about that. And I always felt that the, it, the, the where we have resident driving, driving, is it plan, fund, and operate resident activities. That was ours. But now I see this communication link to board and management on matters of resident concern. The difference between the resident council and the, the board of trustees is that our representation is appointed to the board of trustees, whereas our, our representation to the council are elected. We elected the people, the people who 
I don't think anyone has ever been unelected, but they, we're elected. So I would say that our that we should clarify this function better, because I would see, except for the people appointed to the to the uh, uh, the trustees, our 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 connection to communication and link is advisory at best. Yes, let me make one thing clear. And I wouldn't change it, by the way. You you okay. have. The, the residents elect one representative to the board. Other resident members of the board are not elected, not representative of the residents. They are there for their skills, knowledge, abilities to be good board people and happen to be residents. And we're very fortunate because of that. It's the communications that are enhanced and, and there's not a uh, a legal representation. I think I agree with that, and I think maybe this could be reworded, but the, the point here is, in addition to function one, running all the activities, we need a, a, a conduit, we need a channel of communication between residents and the board. That can be done by individual residents who can call up a board member and say, I think we ought to do this and that. But coming through the council, if it comes through the council to the board, then it seems to me to arrive with more credibility, more weight, more judgment that it's probably widely shared and soundly based and so on. So I think it's it's just the idea that, that one of the things that the council should do is see if, to be sure that the board is getting an accurate representation of what resident views are. I think that's right. Good point. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Well, if there are no questions, thank you all very much. I really appreciate it.